Good morning, I am Shalamari C. Chares, and today I will be discussing about the historical background of Marxism. Marxism originates from the works of 19th century German philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. So first, let's talk about the main proponents of Marxism. The first proponent of Marxism is Karl Marx. Karl Marx is a Jewish German philosopher and a political scientist. He was born on 1818 and died in London in 1883. Marx was known as one of the most influential socialist thinkers in the 19th century. He worked primarily in the realm of political philosophy and was famous advocate for communism. So some of his major works include The Communist Manifesto in 1848 and Das Kapital in 1867. The next proponent is Friedrich Engels. He is a German philosopher, economist, historian, political theorist, and revolutionary socialist. Born on November 28, 1820, and died on August 5, 1895. So he is the closest collaborator of Karl Marx in the foundation of modern communism. They co-authored the Communist Manifesto, and Engels edited the second and third volumes of Das Kapital after Marx's death. So. Basically, he was pretty much Marx's best friend. He also shared Marx's socialist beliefs and provided support financially as well as intellectually. Some of his major works include The Conditions of Working Class in England in 1848 and The Manifesto. Marxism, it is a philosophical and theological belief which originated from the works of 19th century philosophers Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. It's political and economic theory where a society has no classes. Every person within the society works for common good and class struggle is theoretically gone. Marxism also analyzes how social classes, money, and most important, the means of production or factories affects the society. In Marxism, there are two opposing class. First is the bourgeoisie or the ruling class. They are the individuals who have built up their power through the acquisition of capital. They control factories, businesses, and other enterprises. This is probably the social class with the most power and money that we can see today. They tend to receive special treatment and privileges because of their power over government and over all culture. The second class is the working class or also known as proletariat. They do not control institution or political structures like the in the bourgeoisie. Rather, they work for them. Marx and Engels were disappointed with how workers were treated in the great industrial factories of the 19th century. They believed that the working class or proletarians were being exploited and oppressed by the bourgeoisie or the ruling class who generally owned the factories. Marx likes to call it the means of production. So, Marxists advocate a proletarian class uprising against the bourgeoisie in order to make the means of production work for society as whole rather than for the ruling or wealthy minority. This philosophical and ideological belief led to fall of capitalism and ushering of communism where everyone is equal with another being one gets equal share of the society's wealth according to his needs so that is all about the historical background of marxism good day everyone i am javelin palomena and here is our group to discuss about marxist criticism so instead of focusing on text and interpreting them with their hidden meanings Marxist criticism gives an emphasis to the classes and ideologies as they reflect, propagate, and challenge the prevailing social order. It is also a material product that is understood in a historical manner. In short, literary works on the Marxist criticism are viewed as product of work and the production and consumption we all know as economics. And here are the people that is related to the Marxist criticism. First of all, of course, from where it began, Karl Marx. 
Um, he is from 19th century German philosopher, best known for Das Kapital, published in 1867. It consists of seminal work of communist movement. Next is Johann Wolfgang von Goethe and William Shakespeare. They are the two writers where Karl Marx, the first Marxist critic, wrote critical letters or critical essays on 1830s. Then here is the story of Friedrich Engels. When Marx met Friedrich Engels in 1843 and began collaborating on overly political works such as the German ideology in 1846 and the Communist Manifesto in 1848, he maintained a keen interest in literature. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels discussed the relationship between the arts, politics, basic economy, reality in terms of general social theory. Economics, they argue, provides the base or infrastructure of the society from which a superstructure consisting of law, politics, philosophy, religion, and art messages. In 1917, Russia produced revolutionaries like Vladimir Lenin, who shared not only Marx's interest in literature, but also his belief in its ultimate importance, Leon Trotsky. Lenin's comrade in revolution took a strong interest in literary manners as well. Publishing Literary Revolution in 1924, it is which is still viewed as a classic Marxist literary criticism as of today. Michael Bakhtin and George Lucas Bakhtin viewed language, especially literary texts, in terms of discourses and dialogues. A novel written in society in flux, for instance, might include an official legitimate discourse as well as one infiltrated by challenging comments. Lucas, a Hungarian who converted Marxism in 1919, appreciated pre-revolutionary realistic novels that broadly reflected cultural totalities were populated with characters representing human types of the author's place and time. Because Lucas was the best in Soviet communists writing Marxist criticism, in the 1930s and 1940s, non-Soviet Marxists tended to develop their ideas by publicly opposing his. In Germany, dramatist and critic Bert Lott Brecht criticized Lucas for his attempt to enshrine realism as the expand not only to the other isms but also of poetry, drama, which Lucas had largely ignored. Lucien Goldman, a romantic critic living in Paris, combined structuralist principles with Marx-based superstructure model in order to show how economics determines the mental structures of social groups, which are reflected in literary texts. Goldman rejected the idea of individual human genius, choosing instead to see works as the collective products of trans-individual mental structures. Thank you for listening, and now let's proceed to the next reporter. Good day, my name is Simon de la Cruz, and I'm about to discuss Karl Marx and Marxism. So, alam naman natin na yung Marxism ay pumupuna ng mga mali sa capitalism. So, let's continue. Karl Marx was born on 1818 and he died on 1883. So, during his time, dito sumisiklab yung Industrial Revolution. Kaya naman, ganun yung mga pananaw niya at nakikita niya yung mali sa capitalism. So, isa siyang theorist and historian. He perceived human history to have consisted of a series of struggle between classes. So, dalawang class daw yung nagbabanggaan ayon sa kanya. Ito yung mga bourgeoisie, sila yung mga owners, uh, may-ari ng company, at yung mga proletariat, yung mga working, yung mga working, yung mga nasa working class, o yung mga workers. He theorized that when profits are not reinvested in the workers, but in creating more factories, the workers will grow poorer or and poorer. So, nakikita niya na 
mas hihirap yung mga workers kasi hindi dito napupunta yung mga kinikita ng company. Siyempre, as yung mga businessman, gustohin nila na lumago ng lumago yung pera nila. So, magtatayo sila ng magtatayo ng maraming work, ng maraming factory. So, ang mangyayari dito, yung mga mayayaman, lalo silang yung mayaman sa, capitalist, sa, sa capitalism, at yung mga may hirap, lalo silang magiging mahirap. Sabi dito, for a political system to be considered as communist, the underclasses must own the means of production, not the government or the police. So, dapat daw yung mga tao, yung may-ari no production, hindi yung government. Para magkaroon ng, uh, para makonsider as communist yung isang uh, bansa. So, maraming nalilito kung ano ba yung uh, communism or Marxism. So, nakit, nabasa ko na ang Marxism, nag, uh, sasabi siya ng mga problema about capitalism pero hindi siya nagpo-propose ng solution. Well, communism, uh, sinasabi niya kung ano ba yung pwedeng maging solution sa capitalism. Marx argued that communism or Marxism is the best form of government where there is equality in the allocation and distribution of wealth. It attempts to debunk the principles of capitalism. So yun nga, sinabi ko kanina na dinedebunk ni Marx yung principle ng capitalism kasi nakikita niya kung ano yung mangyayari in the future. Marxism theorizes that in order to remove the proletariat From its poor economic situation, a socialist revolution must occur to remove the unconcerned ruling class from government. So sabi niya na mababago lang yung ganitong system kapag nagkaroon ng revolution. Kapag yung mga workers, uh, nag-alsa sila, lumaban sila, hindi sila nagtrabaho. Kasi kailangan sila nung kumpanya. Mas, uh, naisip niya na mas kailangan nung mga owners yung workers nila kesa kailangan nung mga workers yung owner. Ganon yung pananaw ni, ni, ni Karl Marx. Kaya kapag nag-alsa yung, yung mga workers at nagkaroon ng revolution, pagkatapos nun may sisibol daw na bago at magkakaroon na ng kaayusan. O ng, magsimula yung uh, Communism, yun kasi yung talaga ang gusto niya eh, communism. So, isa pa na sinabi ni Karl Marx ay religion is the opiate of the people. So, sinasabi niya yung mga, yung opiate kasi, isa yung uh, medicine or antidepressant. Basta para maging ano ka, para maging okay ka. So, sabi niya dito, uh, yung religion daw, uh, kaya daw yung mga tao okay sila na, na na-oppress kasi nakakasik sila ng comfort sa religion na nagiging okay sila kasi sinasabi ng religion. Parang nagiging selfless. Yun yung isa ko na base. So, nakita rin naman natin to sa ano natin, sa history na yung mga tao, uh, ginamit sa atin yung religion para ma-oppress tayo at masakop tayo. So, naniniwala naman ako dito sa ganitong pananaw ni Karl Marx. Kasi mukha namang totoo. So, here we go about uh, Marxism in literature. The first one said that literature reflects those social institutions out of which it emerges and is itself a social institution with a particular ideological function. So, ang literature daw, ang literature daw nag-reflects a social institution kung saan ito nanggaling. So, ganun naman talaga kasi yung mga author, syempre kung ano yung mas na feel nila, kung ano yung mas nakikita nila in their environment yun yung mas kaya nilang isulat so next one is, literature reflects class struggle and materialism ano ibig sabihin nun? so kadalasan sa mga literature na nakikita natin, maraming maraming literature yung nag, uh, nagpapakita ng journey ng mga mahirap tapos yung success about dun sa pagyaman. So, maraming ganun. Kahit sa mga teleserye sa, Fil- sa Pilipinas, nakikita natin yan. So, Marxists generally view literature not as works created in accordance with timeless artistic criteria, but as products of the economic and ideological determinants specific to that era. So, ganun daw nakikita ng mga Marxists yung literature. Hindi isang timeless piece of arts, kundi isang product nung era na yon kung ano ba yung nangyari, kung ano ba yung naramdaman ng author. Yun daw yung literature. The Marxist critic simply is a careful reader or viewer who keeps in mind issues of power and money and any of the following kind of questions. What role does class play in the work? 
what is the author's analysis of class relations so that's easy on understand it by yourselves how do characters overcome oppression in what ways does the work serve as propaganda for the status quo or does it try to undermine it so paano daw uh, nagiging propaganda yung work sa pagsolve ng mga state affairs tulad sa sa society and political what does the work say about oppression or are social conflicts ignored or blamed elsewhere and does the work propose some form of utopian vision as a solution to the problems encountered in the work? Marxist criticism investigates how literature can work as a force for social change or as a reaffirmation of existing conditions. So Marxist criticism daw, iniimbestigahan o tinitingnan nila kung uh, ano ba yung mangyayari, nagsiserve, nagbibigay ba to ng, ng solution tong literature na to, nare-reflect ba nito yung mga... Uh, issues sa society, uh, meron bang pagbabago sa sa magbabasa nito, ganun, kung basta it's, uh, pag Marxism, uh, kadalasan it's about society or uh, politics, yung tinitingnan nila dun sa loob ng literature. So now, after we know who is Karl Marx and what is Marxism in literature, now let's proceed to the principles of Marxist criticism. First, Mar- Marxist criticism promotes the idea that literature should be a tool in revolutionary struggle. Because it is greatly influenced by the economy, it promotes the idea of revolutionary struggle because it depicts the real work of production and consumption. Next, it aims to arrive at an interpretation of literary text in order to define the political dimensions of literary work. For Marxist criticism gives an emphasis to the class in, it, in ideology, it can show the political uh, power and the citizen's condition through literature or text. Then next, it attempts to clarify the relationship of literary work to social reality and political sense. So the next three principles of Marxist criticism will be discussed by Simon de la Cruz. It believes that the literary work has always a relationship to the society. So, nasabi na natin kanina na tinitingnan ng Marxist criticism o ng Marxist critics kung ano nga ba yung naging uh, relationship ng literary work o kung paano nito napapakita, kung paano nito nire-reflect yung society. Next is, it highlights and lauds solution from the critic. At syempre, dapat makapagpakita rin nito ng solution sa societal problems. And lastly, it judge literature by how it represent the main struggle for power going on that time. How it may influence those struggles. So, dapat uh, dina, dina judge ng, Marx, ng Marxist critics yung Uh, literature, kung paano ba nito pinapakita yung struggles sa power at kung paano ba ito na influensyahan ng mga struggles na yan. So, what do you mean by main struggles for power? So, yun yung mga uh, taong na-oppress tungkol ito sa oppression. So, siguro, kung mababasa ng Marxist critics yung No Limitang Her and El Fili. Yeah, siguro mataas yung grade. Naisip ko lang. So, that's all. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Emily Medico, and I will be reporting about reading as Marxist critic. So, in reading a literary piece using the Marxist lens, we should take a careful eye on the following. First, what is the economic status of the characters? Socioeconomic status is typically broken into three levels, mainly the high, middle, and low. Thus, in reading a text through a Marxist lens, madali nating ma-assess ang economic status ng isang tao through various variables, such as their income, education, occupation, or family background. Second, what happens to them as a result of this status? So, ayun, pag nasa high-class category ang character, andun yung respect sa kanya ng tao. They have the authority and power na masunod yung mga gusto nila. Pag low class naman, opposite naman. They are usually the powerless and inferior and ordinarily tagasunod lang sa gusto ng superior sa kanila. Third, how do they fare against economic and political odds? 
one thing I noticed is merong isang similarity ang bawat character belonging in different classes in the society. And that is, they are both striving. So in what way? Low class characters are striving para kahit papano ay ma-provide nila yung basic needs nila. Minsan, nakakagawa din sila ng mga bagay gaya ng pagnanakaw at napapasok din nila yung ibang dishonorable works just to earn money. Whereas, yung high class naman, nag strive din sila. Pero, for supremacy naman. Sila commonly yung characters na hindi marunong makontento sa meron sila at nagpapahirap lalo sa may hirap na characters. Number 4. What other conditions stemming from their class does the writer emphasize? Masasagot natin ang tanong na ito base sa context na nakasaad sa literature. Anong situation ba o environment ang nakapalibot sa bawat character? Fifth, to what extent does the work fail by overlooking the economic, social, and political implications of its material? So, even a great work of literature has flaws. Therefore, as a Marxist reader, we should also carefully spot the work's weaknesses, particularly in economic, social, and political aspects, kasi yun yung focus ng Marxist criticism. Six, in what other ways does economic determinism affect, affect the work? So, to define economic determinism, it is a social economic theory that is primarily associated with Karl Marx. It also allows those who are economically empowered to use their finances to establish political rule over the working class. So, laging mas angat yung mas mataas na class. In short, paano nakaka-apekto ang bourgeoisie sec or capitalist at proletariat or laborers sa work? May kapitalism ba na nangyayari? Unfair ba yung ratio ng work sa profit ng laborers? Mga ganong questions pa. And lastly, seventh, how should the readers consider this story in today's developed or underdeveloped world? So as a Marxist reader or critic, consider asking yourself if this story has a significant relevance today. Like, ano yung influence na pwedeng maitulong ng story na ito to move you in doing something to bring change in today's society? And of course, by looking to these questions, mapapansin natin umiiko talaga siya sa driving forces of the different classes sa society. So, as a Marxist critic, remember na hindi lamang limited sa mga tanong na ito ang pwede natin may consider when critiquing a literary piece. So, now, tumako naman tayo sa keywords to look for using Marxist criticism. First, economic power. So, lagi nating tatandaan na kapag narinig natin ang word na Marxist, ang kakambal niyan lagi ay yung words na economy and society. Kasi for the Marxists, economic system is the moving force behind the human history. Meaning, Para maipaliwanag natin yung nangyayari sa story, lagi dapat tayong naglulook for the history o pinag-ugatan ng social context na yun. For instance, share ko lang no, let's be realistic. Maraming issues ang naglipa na pagdating sa distribution ng ayuda. May ibang dinabigyan, tas may ibang nagdoble pa ng natanggap. Kaya naman maraming taong nangangailangan talaga ang nagpo-post sa social media ng rants nila. Kasi social media nowadays is a direct network para ma-reach ang concerns natin sa gobyerno. So you see, there is a reason behind this behavior sa citizens. And that is the unfair or limited opportunities na napapabigay sa kanila kaya nagre-result sa ganong actions. Second naman is materialism versus spiritualism. Si Karl Marx naniniwala siya na ang reality daw ay material and not spiritual. Lahat ng meron tayo ngayon ay bunga ng social construction o gawa lang din ng mga tao. Gaya ng technology or our basic needs and all of these realities. So for example, a character in the story is described to be homeless and hungry. Then may dumating na dalawang tao. Yung isa nag offer ng prayers, tapos yung isa naman food and drink. So as a Marxist literature, 
tinanggap ng character sa story yung food and drink kaysa sa prayer kasi what he needs are material needs na nangangailangan ng instant gratification. Third naman is class conflict. Ito napaka-common ito. It is understood that the conflict here principally means that friction between the proletariat or working class and the bourgeoisie or the ruling class. So, for instance, in the drama Romeo and Juliet, it features a love story between two lovers who came from different classes of society as it seems everyone else are not in favor of it. Napaka-common ito sa stories kung saan ito yung cause of conflict. Then, as a result, talagang pinaghihiwala yung characters kasi gusto nila kung mayaman ka, dapat mayaman din ang mapapangasawa mo. And lastly is yung ideologies, arts, and literature. So, according to Karl Marx, the dominant or stronger class talaga yung nagro-rule lagi sa society, leaving the weaker class na mag-strive para kahit papano ay makapag-fit sila. So, for example, in the story The Necklace, yung main character na si Mathilde ay nangangailangan ng damit at necklace na susuotin para sa ball na pupuntahan niya. So, what she did is she borrowed a necklace from her wealthy friend na si Madame Forestier para pang terno sa damit na meron siya kasi hindi niya nga afford bumili ng necklace. So, yun, kitang kita dito yung ideology na sa upper class, hindi welcome yung mga walang means para makibagay sa kanila. Kaya kinakailangan pang humiram ng necklace ng character sa story nito to fit herself with the elite sa ball. So, that's all for my report. Thank you for listening. And now, let us move on to the discussion. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Adjolin B. Padua, and I am here to discuss to you on how to analyze a literary piece using Marxist criticism. We are aware that there are many literary pieces around the world, and each literary piece has its own meaning. However, its meaning depends on the literary point of view of the reader. And this time, we will see a literary piece from Marxist view. So how should we analyze a literary piece in Marxist criticism? First is, approach the text with an eye for how the characters interact. See how each character talks to each other. Are they friendly, arrogant, or rude? Marxist thought relies on a relationship between individuals that even its social aspect can be part of this criticism. Second is, evaluate the vocational roles of all the characters. It is inevitable to see the social classes in every literature. There will always be someone from higher class status and lower class status. It is essential to see their character development. Marxist criticism includes a focus on a class system and the most direct way to look for it is through their vocation. And how to test their system? Look at the level of luxury each of the characters have and how much they have to work for a living. Third is how the characters use their free time. It is not like there will always be something the characters have to work with. Of course, they all have their free time. It is a part of Marxist criticism that individuals use their free time productively, meaning they do not have to waste their time, thus spend their time to do something useful. It also contributes to see how an individual use their free choices or free will. Fourth is see the role of the government in the literature. From Marxist thought, the government sets as a model for liberty and communalism. Communalism is a governmental system to which each community is virtually an independent state and the nation is merely a federation of such states. To see this in literature, you have to look on how the government solicits citizenship. Is it draconian or what the society calls a harsh law? Or lies is fair? Or when the government let the citizens do whatever they want with their property? And as an example, we will all talk about one of the most renowned romantic novels, The Pride and Prejudice, written by Jane Austen. This novel focuses on the romance of the two dynamic main characters, namely Fitzwilliam Darcy, a wealthy nobleman, and Elizabeth Bennet, the second daughter from the Bennet household. Now, we will analyze this novel using Marxist criticism. 
So first is the interaction between the characters. So since the characters in this novel are all from wealthy households, they all treat each other with respect, most especially when they interact with the noblemen. And considering the era they were in, Victorian era, they have demure demeanor, especially the women. Next is the vocational roles of all the characters. For the noblemen such as Fitzwilliam Darcy and Charles Bingley, they do not have to work for a living. Both of them have huge family inheritance to live without working. For example, Fitzwilliam Darcy is believed to have inherited a huge sum of money, about 5,000 euros, and he has a 4,000 euros annual income that could make him a lord of a large estate. It may not be directly stated in the story, but maybe a reason for his income is that they have a noble title or they have a business in the capital London. As for the others, such as the Bennett family, they are in the higher middle class that is considered to be almost on the same par with the noblemen. They have business run by their father. And unlike the other households, they do not have house servants but they have helpers in their farm. Third is how the characters spend their time. If you have already read or watched Pride and Prejudice, I am sure that you notice how often they attend parties. With occasion or none, the characters love to hold parties in their estates and have fun with other people. And for most of the times, the bachelors and bachelorettes use these opportunities to look for a lover. Moreover, some other pastimes can also be noted such as Mr. Darcy spending his time reading and writing inside the library, or Elizabeth's younger sisters strolling around the nearby town to see the military officials stationed there. And lastly, the role of the government in the story. As I said, this novel focuses on the relationships between the characters that is why the government has not taken any part in it. However, if you analyze the story closely, you could say that they have a license fair as the citizens are free to use their properties without the government's permission. Other than that, the setting of the story which is in United Kingdom can be considered a communal country as this is a political union between England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And for the last guidelines for analyzing a literary piece in Marxist criticism is to use Marxist writers as a guide. There are probably many Marxist writers that you could parallel your work with. And among many known Marxist writers, I chose these three writers. First is Theodor W. Adorno, a German philosopher, sociologist, psychologist, musicologist, and composer known for his critical theory of society. He is known for his writings such as The Dialectic of Enlightenment, published in 1947, and Minima Moralia, published in 1951. Next is Martin Glaberman. He is an American Marxist writer on labor, history, academics, and auto worker. He is known for his work such as Wartime Strikes, The Struggles Against the No Strike Pledge in the UAW During World War II, and Marxism of Our Times, CLR James on Revolutionary Organization. And lastly is David W. Harvey. He is a British-born Marxist economic geographer, podcaster, and distinguished professor of anthropology and geography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is known for his work, Social Justice and the City. And that is all for my report. Thank you very much for listening. Good day everyone, this is Erica Franz de Milio, the last reporter of our group, and I will be going to discuss writing your Marxist criticism. As we all know, writing involves its three main stages, which are the pre-writing, drafting, and revising. Let us start with the first stage, which is the pre-writing stage. This is the stage where you plan and prepare your writing. And this is also where you research your topic 
and look for relevant resources. In writing Marxist criticism, the pre-writing stage includes the following. First, you have to clarify your understanding of the ideology of the work. A premise of Marxist criticism is that literature can be viewed as ideological. Thus, you have to understand that it emphasizes class, socioeconomic status, power relations among various segments of society, and the representations of those segments. Second, you have to identify the elements of the text that present the ideology. These elements include the plot, characters, settings, themes, conflict, and point of view. And in third, you have to determine how these elements promote the ideology. Your goal here is to convince your reader to accept it. Fourth, you have to assess how sympathetic or opposed it is to Marxist principles. You have to assess how does your text depict a struggle between classes, or how does class contribute to the conflicts of the text. And lastly, you have to examine the introduction, setting, or overall status of the society as regards to the economic, social, and cultural aspects. At the beginning, you may try to seek and understand the apartheid or the inequality that is present in the society. You may try to seek what class does the character belongs to. Also, what struggles or conflicts are presented from the beginning. Let us now proceed to the next two stages of writing, which are the drafting and revising. Drafting occurs when you put your ideas into sentences and paragraphs. Here, you concentrate upon explaining and supporting your ideas fully. Here, you also begin to connect your ideas. But, you don't need to have a perfect first draft. You don't need to edit or proofread yet on this stage. And the last stage, which is the revising, includes editing and proofreading. This is the stage where you make sure that your text is coherent and written accurately. It is the key to effective writing. Here, you think more deeply about your reader's needs and expectations on your writings. And this is the time when your writing becomes reader-centered. In writing Marxist criticism, both drafting and revising includes the following parts. First is the introduction, wherein you can introduce your chosen Marxist scenario from the selection and explain its relation to Marxist ideology at the outset. After this introduction, the rest of your essay will be greatly concerned with where and how the ideology is worked out. Here, you may begin by narrating an incident in the selection that illustrates the social relationships of the characters or some other socioeconomic aspect of the society as preparation for your statement of the work's overall worldview. The next part is the body wherein the central part of your essay is your acceptance or rejection of the Marxist principles in the text you are analyzing. Here, you may refer here, you may first describe a major character or characters. What are his or her characteristics? Where do they belong in the society? What's their status in their society? Next, assess the nature of the social institutions depicted. What classes or socioeconomic statuses are presented in the text? Are all the segments of society accounted for? Or does the text exclude a particular class? Lastly, point out the struggles between groups of people. What socioeconomic problems were faced by the group of people? How did it affect their lives? And the third and the last part is the conclusion, wherein the conclusion of a Marxist criticism often takes either form of first, 
an endorsement of the classless society in which everyone has equal access to power and goods. Second, a criticism of repressive societies when that is not the case, and lastly, making a case for social reform, pointing out that the selection has either supported or rejected social change. In any cases, to wrap up your conclusion, you will need to consider how the ideology of the text affirms or conflicts your own. You may find it interesting to reflect on what the work has revealed to you about your own ideology. Explaining your realization can provide a powerful ending to your analysis. And for the last part, I will end the discussion through this quotation. If we have chosen the position in life in which we can most of all work for mankind, no burdens can bow us down because they are sacrifices for the benefit of all. Then we shall experience no petty, limited selfish joy, but our happiness will belong to millions. Our deeds will live on quietly, but perpetually at work, and over our ashes will be shed the hot tears of noble people. This is by Karl Marx in his Reflections of a Young Man on 1835. So that concludes our discussion for today. Thank you so much for listening.